Hi, my name is Tejasvi. I'm a partner solution architect here at AWS. Joining me, we have Ryan Niksh. Ryan, say hi. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm a solutions architect here with the Amazon Partner Team. I focus on application platforms, modernization solutions, and hybrid architectures. So for a very long time, OpenShift on AWS had a fairly consistent architecture where if you're deploying a self-managed OpenShift OCP, or uh, you're deploying a managed OpenShift like Rosa. Uh, we've had most of the OpenShift environment deployed into a customer's account. Uh, with the recent announcement of uh, Rosa hosted control planes, there are some changes uh, with the new architecture. Uh, so Ryan, can you explain uh, the concept of hosted control plane and how it differs from the traditional um, OpenShift on AWS? Okay, well, I'm happy to do that. Let's take half a step back and have a look at what the uh, architecture looked like in a customer account uh, historically. Mm -hmm. So when we deploy OpenShift, and this is going back a very long time now, whether it was OpenShift 3, OpenShift 4, whether it was self-managed OpenShift or managed OpenShift, everything was deployed into a customer's account. So we had the entire environment inside the customer's account on AWS. And, and typically what that looked like was a collection of control plane nodes or what was called master nodes. These are the uh, OpenShift control plane, they're the API endpoints. Uh, these are three of them and they are spread across three availability zones uh, with inside that AWS account. Uh, there's also a additional three EC2 instances that would form the infrastructure nodes. Most importantly, these would contain things such as the OpenShift routing layer, monitoring, logging, uh, those sort of elements. And, and then there was n number of compute or worker nodes. And these EC2 instances, the attached EBS volumes, all of this would deploy into the customer's account. And a couple of questions I would get typically is, you know, I've got a relatively small cluster implementation. Do I need all of this uh, to cater for the relatively small number of applications I'm running? Or how do I mitigate costs around this? How do I defer some of this cost related to the underlying EC2 and EBS resources in the account? Mm. Uh, other questions I get is, this is a little bit different from other AWS services. If you look at things like EKS as an example, uh, the control plane infrastructure doesn't live in the customer's account, it, it lives somewhere else. So one of the things that we've changed moving to hosted control planes is we've created a different account. And this account is a service account. And the service account does not exist within the customer account. So this is like all of our other AWS services where there's a control plane somewhere else that's owned by the service team. And what we have immediately done is we've removed some of the components out of the customer account and moved them into the service account. So notably, the control plane nodes or the master nodes are now in that service account and we physically remove them out of the customer's account. Hmm. Okay, so that means that there are some kind of uh, benefits for customer uh, when it comes to the cost reduction in their AWS resources with the hosted control plane. Could so, you talk more about that? Yeah, immediately what we see as, as a cost reduction is the underlying AWS resources cost, the EC2 instances, the EBS volumes, those are no longer within the customer's account, so we get a, a cost reduction from that. There's an additional layer of cost reduction. Uh, the etcd layer of you know, the database that backs Kubernetes, sits on these master nodes. And in order to maintain its resilience model, etcd replicates between all of these nodes. And what this results in is inter-availability zone data transfer costs. So by moving the etcd layer into the service uh, account, we again remove all of the costs related to that inter-availability zone data transfer 
out of the customer account. Again, giving a little bit of a, a cost break point there. The other thing that we've done is we've actually taken the infrastructure nodes and we've, we've removed those. So what we've done is we've taken some of the functions that used to exist on those infrastructure nodes and we've moved them into the service account mm -hmm. and we're running them on the masters. So essentially we've collapsed the control plane into a, a single layer instead of separating it. Uh, historically, we did this because they scale differently. They have a slightly different resilience models. Uh, so with it being in the customer's account, separate them for simplicity's sakes. But now because we're running it on behalf of the customer in a service account, you know, you will own the complexities of that. The other thing that we've done is the OpenShift router layer. So the entry point into the application workloads. So the customer's applications are, are running over here at the work level. What we've done is we've moved the OpenShift router or router layer onto the worker node. So the router layer for OpenShift stays in the customer account, uh, but largely everything else moves into that service account. Great. Um, so there's a shift in the usage of private link. Um, how is the role of private link changed in the context of hosted control planes? So it, it's with managed OpenShift or ROSA or OpenShift dedicated, uh, there was a private link endpoint attached to the customer account. This was to allow Red Hat SRE members to be able to access the cluster and manage that cluster on their behalf. Mm -hmm. With the move to hosted control plans in the service account, the SRE members now are going to manage the OpenShift cluster from within the service account, directly interacting with the OpenShift API or the OpenShift control plane which means that this private link connection now is used for the compute layer or the worker nodes to interact with the control plane. So we're still using the private link connection, but for a different purpose over here. We're facilitating connections between the two uh, elements of OpenShift here. And the SREs are directly interacting through the service account. Great. Uh, so. How are the things on the security side, Ryan, for host control plane? Uh, this isn't a huge shift from what we had traditionally in ROSA Classic to hosted control plane. You're still going to see the same sort of security benefits. Mm -hmm. There's one subtle difference. What we've done is we have uh, changed the IAM roles to be a, a lot more um, uh, scoped down to function. So again, another step towards least privilege. Mm -hmm. The IAM roles that you would require for provisioning and installation, they're going to change ever so slightly because now we need to be able to write into different accounts and things. So when you're deploying ROSA, you would go through a command line step where you go ROSA create account roles. Mm -hmm. If you are an existing ROSA customer and you've already done that, your old account roles are, are not going to cater for all of the things needed for HCP. So you would have to rerun that ROSA create account roles to get all of the updates. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've never used ROSA before and you're doing this the first time, you're going to get the latest and greatest. So just to quickly summarize over here, uh, that is very, very small changes to uh, identity and access management, and specifically the roles and related policies that you'd need to generate. All of this is documented within the ROSA documentation. You are going to see it under the prerequisites. Uh, other things that are going to crop in from a prerequisites perspective is secure token service or the integration with Amazon Secure Token Service for least privilege and credential cycling, uh, that is no longer an option. So many customers were using that, we've made that the default, so ROSA hosted control planes is going to have that as a prerequisite to implementation. Mm -hmm. The other thing is um, uh, these are going to be private link clusters, they, they're not going to be exposed publicly. Most of our customers are deploying a private cluster and then exposing that through something like a, a security layer in the ingress and egress VPCs. So again, this is going to be something where there's no public option for a cluster. Uh, we just found people were using it. So it, it's 
uh, dash dash private link, it will deploy this into a private link architecture. Great. Uh, so what is the provisioning time for hosted control plane? So an interesting one, it, with OpenShift historically, when you provisioned OpenShift, it would build out the, the control plane, the master nodes. They would provision to a point, then they would provision the compute layer. Once that compute layer was up, it would then create things such as the infrastructure nodes, and then it would generate you know, the router layer, the ingress controllers. Once all of that had been done, the API was up and, and ready for interaction. What we've done with ROSA, specifically in hosted control planes, we're now building things in parallel. So what happens is the uh, control plane comes up in parallel with the worker nodes, and 10 minutes. Wow. <laughs> but I just want to put some fine points here. It, it's, it's not 10 minutes for the entire OpenShift environment to be up and running. It's 10 minutes for the OpenShift API and control plane to be available. So this means that customers who need to do post-deployment configurations, things like single sign-on, things like integration with their CI-CD pipelines, uh, adding in additional security tools, installing operators, those sort of things, they can start doing that post-configuration within 10 minutes of running their ROSA create command where if I compare that to pre-hosted control plane or ROSA classic, you're, you're talking 30, 45 minutes. So in terms of having a functional cluster where you can start doing things, I think 10 minutes is a, a, a fantastic time reduction. Um, the compute layer will be up and you can actually start deploying application workloads. I think it's somewhere around the 30 minute mark. So again, a little bit faster, but not as super shiny as, as 10 minutes. Got it. Yep. Um, are there any specific prerequisites that users need to uh, be mindful of? Okay, so I um, did touch on these earlier, but I, I think the big ones is the change to the IAM roles for provisioning. So go into the documentation, have a look at those prerequisites. Um, again, it, it might require just the rerun of that uh, create account roles command. Um, STS becoming a prerequisite over here. I, I don't think that's much of a prerequisite. Most of the customers I'm working with, and when I say most, I'd say 95% of customers I'm currently engaging with are, are using STS by default, which is one of the reasons why it's become so prevalent. Mm -hmm. uh, Private link is going to force you into a private VPC architecture. So uh, there is a very, very neatly documented what does the VPC need to look like. It's not going to support a, um, uh, the ability to generate the VPC from OpenShift itself. So you have to deploy into a pre-existing VPC. Again, on the ROSA documentation, you can find the details for that, as well as some Terraform infrastructure as code templates actually go and build out the VPCs if you don't already have that. Most customers I'm working with are using something like a uh, Amazon control plane or an organizations to build out the VPCs and then they're deploying ROSA into an existing VPC anyway. So I don't see a huge uh, shift there. Great. Um, thank you, Ryan. Thank you for explaining us the concept of hosted control planes. Thank you for joining us. And thank you.